I like I like your the idea for another podcast you had last week, Dork Dungeons, where just bitch about things. I know, right? When I just because <laughs> last week uh, uh, I. We were doing something, I think, related to TikTok or no? We were just playing magic. TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> uh, we were just playing. We were just playing magic, and we got done. And I opened up, and I was like, unsubscribing from emails, and it took me like four clicks to get to the unsubscribe. And I'm like, dude, uh, you've got you're on the Gmail life, right? Gmail life. Yeah, on on Gmail as your email, right? Yeah, my Gmail's my email. Okay, yeah, but a lot of the times you get those emails, and it'll just, and Google will just make a big unsubscribe button for you at the top, and I hit that, and it just does all the shit for you, and it just brings you to the unsubscribe page. Huge fan of that feature. Very big fan. But yeah, I would love to do a, uh, a just a bitching and complaining podcast. <laughs> right. I don't know if that would if that really has any sort of broad market appeal, but you know. I mean. I've got a lot of opinions. I've got a lot of opinions and a lot of things I want to bitch and complain about. I, I find and, myself the more, more and more having, uh, realizing how small things are getting to me. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very George Costanza, George Costanza of hit early 2000s, late 90s sitcom Seinfeld. Yes. Of course, yes. George Costanza, when discussing the Festivus for the rest of us, I got a lot of problems with you people. Got a lot of problems with you people. I got a lot of things. Need I to air say. some grievances. Got ooh, the festivus airing of grievances is, I that should just be a daily practice in most people's lives. The airing of grievances instead of letting things bottle up. People bottle shit up all the time and then it explodes violently. Yes. You could also yell at the void. You ever seen that scream yeah. scream ser- therapy? Yeah, yeah, that is. An, it's this. It's the same. It gives me the same vibe of like the the like destruction like rage rooms yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like that just like they, they just put up a bunch of glass and they give you a baseball bat and you're like have that and it's like i mean i guess that's an outlet yeah <laughs> there's probably healthier ways to do this but i I'm mean martial arts judge. is pretty much the, like the same thing it's like sure you train pretty much you train to learn to self-defense and you learn proper technique but then like i did martial arts for several years so that would be the first half of the class and the second half of the class would be either be sparring or breaking or just like Hitting, hitting pads. All right, go, Just go to the, go to the bags for twenty minutes. Hit the bag, hit the bags, slap an ass, you know, tap out on someone's junk. Totally fair, all fair game. It's kind of yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this episode of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, episode sixty six of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, the D and D and MTG podcast. I'm Connor and I'm Sam. We are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. I, one of these days, we need to make a dungeon. You know, if we, I, I feel like I feel like this would be brought up every fucking episode. But it really, I, if we moved into the basement area, mm-hmm. we, we could make it. It, a dungeon. it would be effectively a dungeon because that part of the house is underground. It is. Is it entirely under? It's not entirely underground, but it's no, mostly. It's underground. like the inside part is underground. The outside part yeah. is uh, garage. The garage. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, the front of the house yeah. is the garage that leads to the street level. Which I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. As far as as far as apartments go, like this is a fucking sweet deal. Oh All yeah, things considered. Oh, even yeah. even after a couple of rent increases, it's like fairly reasonable still. Like yeah, I've I've seen friends of ours who live more north, mm-hmm. and it's like ah, oh. or well, the problem is is when people live in newer builds. Yeah, the people love people love a new construction. Mm-hmm. People love like ooh, I want to live by myself. It's like okay, or fair. Live right next to like big uh, big, yeah. not metropolitan. Like Cincinnati is obviously. We, we live right near Cincinnati. The The main part of Cincinnati is very small. Mm-hmm. But then there's a bunch of more outer areas that are like, oh, here's a really expensive area to live, like Oakley or mm-hmm. Norwood or uh, uh, Westchester or Mason. And people are like, I want to live near these areas. It's like, yeah, or if you could just live out in the boonies like 10 more minutes out and just be paying low less. I guess, and, and, the, and the craziest part is, is like you can live close to an interstate and have very quick and easy access to any of these parts within 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. So. I don't know. Th- this literally applies to nobody listening to this. No. But, you know, except maybe our friends, at which point they already know all of this. <laughs> I think most of our friends who listen live up in, like, Springfield, Dayton area. That's true. That's true. Uh, we are working on another round of bonus action, bonus Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, where we have uh, friends from the internet and possibly real life come on and we have we have a discussion about various topics. We are looking for, uh, I- to bring back Ivy of... Uh, Crit Awards. Crit Awards. Oh my gosh, I can't speak today. Yes, Ivy of the Crit Awards. She's CEO of the Crit Awards, which is the Creator Recognition and Tabletop RPGs Awards. Uh, they're going to have their second annual award show at Gen Con this year. 
and uh, we're going to we're going to be doing a little bit of a, a dive into the finalists yeah. once the the voting for that is wrapped up. You can of course go to CritAwards.com and submit your your votes for for nominations and all of that. Uh, speaking of Gen Con, though, we have finally booked our Airbnb for <laughs> Gen Con Indie. That's August first to fourth this year. Gen Con Indie is the largest uh, tabletop gaming convention in the world. Best four days in gaming. That is that is their slogan. That is their slogan. We still need to get you your pass. Ah, yes, we do. Yes, uh, but I have I have mine, and we have our Airbnb booked, and we're going to be there for all four days. It'll be a wonderful time. Uh, feel free to come say hi. We will be at the Crit Awards, which will be there. Uh, we are also this is this is there been some rumblings for a while in our tumblies with this pot with this episode of the podcast. I'm going to, we're going to be making our first post on Patreon. Dot com. If you're listening to this live, uh, the link's not in our link in bio yet. But by the time you listen to this tomorrow, manana, manana, when the podcast goes live, we will have a Patreon, which is available to you. Uh, the 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 value tier, as I'm going, as I'm currently calling it, we might rename it the five dollar tier. That's the tier that's just never going to increase in value, and that's the one where or increase in cost to you. The value, hopefully, will just continue to rise as time goes on. That's where you're going to get early ad free access to the podcast, and with that. This episode of the podcast for patrons is going to go live on Wednesday, and it will go live in the free feeds on Wednesday for this week. But starting with the next episode of the podcast, it will go live on Wednesday onto Patreon as per normal. And then the following Monday is when it will go live for uh, free the freeloaders, the freebies. It will go live on the following Monday. Hmm. That is the plan that I'm going with. All right. I don't know, I don't know if you agree with this plan or not, but... Alas, here we are. I say we um, rob a bank. Sure. sure. Okay, cool. Sure. Uh, we will also remove the ad reads from the Patreon version as, you know, ads and all that. Which we don't really have We a don't lot really of. do it. <laughs> we don't now. really. But for example, and that's going to be the part where this is going to be the part where we cut for the Patreon version. Gotcha. And it's going to be a whole, it's going to be a whole thing. But this episode of the Duels of Mandadors podcast is sponsored by... Proxy Forge. Tyler over at Proxy Forge. He's a good friend of ours at this point, I would say. He's a cool dude. Yeah. Very cool dude. He makes high quality Magic the Gathering proxies with custom art. Uh, you can get packs of cards that are geared around pre-con upgrades. So you get a commander with an alternate art for a pre-con and uh, nine cards that can be used to swap into the deck and soup up the power level of the deck. You can get very expensive cards for a very low price. You can get whole cycles of lands, including the fetch lands, shock lands, uh, original dual lands, and many, many others. You can also get them organized by color pairing, so you can get a pack of Azorius lands, which include uh, an array of all of the different types of lands that go with blue and white or any other color combination. Uh, you can also get triumphs. You can get the power nine. They got a whole bunch. He's got a whole bunch of amazing cards. He's a really cool, dude. Just, just a guy. He's just a guy. So it's not some some big corporation. It is a little bit pricier than a normal proxy, but the quality is very high. They feel like real magic cards. Uh, they've got a ton of different options for some of the more popular cards. You can go check the link in the bio and go to proxyforge.com. Um, if you use the link in the bio, it helps us out as well. So that was the ad read that I cut out. If you're if you happen to subscribe to us on Patreon, you might be like, "Oh, there wasn't an ad read there." That's the point. That is the point of that. So, <laughs> that's uh, that's dumb. That's a dumb bit. But you know, here we are. I might. I'm probably gonna do the ad reads separately from now on. Just and, insert and, them. Yeah, just insert them. Oh, insert them. Later. I like that idea. I was yeah. actually. I was literally gonna say. I was gonna wait until after we were done, and then say, "Hey, what? What in the future? What, how about how we do?" The, and yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I've got a microphone on my desk, so that's a very that's a very easy do. It's very easy do, especially because the free feed where the ads are going to be is going to be a little bit delayed. So I'll have time there you go. to do that. There you, go. you can also just record it and put the same one in a couple of times and then okay. update it from time to time. Anyway, update it when we get more sponsors. Of course, sponsors. of course. Anyway, uh, before we get into the news today, we are talking about the one D and D fireside chat video that they posted. This is a a bit of a deeper analysis and insight into the one D and D player's handbook, or as they're calling it, the twenty twenty four revision of fifth edition. 
which is a little bit silly. We get a little bit more information about the player's handbook there. Um, we also we can chat a little bit about Vecna Eve of Rome. Don't really want to get too deep into that just because spoilers. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks to be a very popular adventure right now. And, of course, the quarterly earnings report for Hasbro. We're going to dive into that a little bit. If you are a fan of D&D and Magic, you probably should know how the parent company is doing. Because if it's going to go under, that's going to fuck with your day a little bit. It's going to affect us greatly. Indeed. Indeed. And we've got some various other Magic the Gathering news in terms of leaks for Modern Horizons 3. A new Secret Lair Super Drop. D&D Pride Yes, is it just a whole D&D Pride event, a whole a whole smattering of things. Uh, but of course, you can get this podcast every other week. We record it live on TikTok where you can give questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas. I'll also be posting a thread onto the Patreon where you can submit questions if you are so inclined there. You can get the podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, wherever you get your podcast. You can get the video version on YouTube and Patreon. You can follow us on TikTok, Instagram. All that kind of stuff. We do Monday Night Magic. We're doing live streams on YouTube now for the Monday Night Magic. We're kind of we're expanding the sphere of influence. Quite a time. Yes, it's quite what a, time. a time to be alive. But we will go over the upcoming releases as we always do, just so that you're aware of what's coming up, Sam. Yeah. So first off in the D and D realm, we have Vecna Eve of Ruin. Uh, that is available on D and D Beyond and in your local game stores today. The day of recording, May seventh. Mm-hmm. Uh, full retail release will be in two weeks on May twenty first. Uh, Vecna: Nest of the Evil Eye is a prequel adventure that it would it came with all the pre orders, and you can also get it on D and D Beyond for four dollars and ninety nine cents. Uh, next up, we have the ori- the making of original D anD D nineteen seventy nineteen seventy six. Not an adventure, more of a coffee table book that comes out June eighteenth. And finally, the last of the twenty fourteen re- edition of D and of fifth oh, edition. The, the, the naming conventions on this man. It, it really could be. They should have just made it one D anD D. One D D or five point five. They could have cha- They've done so many of that. Things. They they could have just made it Dungeons and Dragons. Dangans and Durgans. And no no suffix at all. No prequel. No, right. No, I, just that, call it that. That was the original. That was like, this is the this is the ultra less final version of D&D that... Until they the, decide they want to sell more books. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so the last of the 2014 edition uh, books that will be coming out this year is The Quest from the Infinite Staircase. That is the anthology for this year. It, that will be available at D&D Beyond and at your local game stores on July 9th with the full release on July 16th. So Vecna Eve of Ruin, there's a lot of a lot of chatter going around it right now. I haven't looked too deeply into it because spoilers and I think I am going to be getting this book just because mm. it's like it's it's like it's the it's the it's the 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 send off. It's the it's mm-hmm. the Avengers Endgame of fifth edition as we've known it up to this point. And it seems kind of important to at least have around. It's gonna have a lot of reference. It's gonna be very interesting to see how they lay out a high level adventure. Yeah. As far as adventure goes, this is like the only published one that's gone up to twentieth level. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a little bit crazy. Uh, people are seem to be very, very into it. They seem to be doing a bigger marketing push for this adventure book than they normally do for adventure books. Yeah, a lot of the adventure books over the past year and a half have not gotten a lot of airtime. There was like the, how was it, the one d d It wasn't the Summit, it was the, the Direct, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. a year and two years ago. That was really big, and they were doing all this push, and then just silence. silence. And it's like, it, and every time they would release like a collection, it's like, oh, Dragonlance, it's going to be fucking Dragonlance. This is going to be dope. And then... It, there's like a little bit there's like a video and then it's released and then they never speak of it again yeah and there's no advertising and then it was like that with uh what was it planescape no not planescape um the the space one that oh. had the three books that were really small mm, uh of yeah now spell jammers thank you yeah Jeez. god wow spell jammers that that release well for one there was a controversy with ai art in that one we'll get into that later they got a response for ai art huh? but even with that one, it was like a little three pack of books. We got the whole set for like thirty dollars because it got immediately discounted and no advertising push after the the controversy yeah. at all. Nope. And it's just happened over and over and over again. The the obviously the anthology book is going to most probably be very good because all of them have been pretty good. Yeah. But. Do you think it's kind of that lame duck sort of situation with them because they've been like I mean obviously one D and D has been in play tests for. A very long time now, mm-hmm. and and we, I mean we only got the release dates um, less than a month ago. Yeah, um, they they so just kind of like yeah, they're just kind of trailing off at this point, like pushing, pushing out what they have. Yeah, I I wouldn't be surprised by that. 
Um, but obviously, it's very clear that Vecna, Eve of Ruin, has been given a bit more love and affection mm-hmm. as a nice like send off for the previous fifth edition as we enter the revised fifth edition era. Yes, of fifth edition. The twenty twenty four revision uh, of the one D and D player's handbook will be available on September seventeenth. The one D and D Dungeon Master's Guide will be available November twelfth, and the one D and D Monster Manual will be available February eighteenth of next year. Uh, each of those will have, I believe it's a week earlier, will be available um, on D&D Beyond. On D&D Beyond, yes. Uh, and all, apparently, we'll get into this a little bit when we're talking about the Fireside Chat. These books are going to be notably larger in terms of yes. page count and content uh, as compared to the 2014 Brethren. Yes. So, uh, But not quite yet as we have to go through the... Uh, other half of Wizards of the Coast, Mo- uh, Magic the Gathering with Modern Horizons 3. Uh, the pre-release for that will be June 7th and the full release on June 14th. There have been spoilers. We talked oh, about yeah. some last and uh, last episode and yeah, we have more. We, we talked about the Flipwalkers. Yeah, the Flipwalkers. Those are very cool. But we got some new ones that they've also officially released because there's so many leaks. Yep. Uh also coming in uh, July 5th of this year will be the Assassin's Creed Universes Beyond uh, with the Beyond Boosters. Beyond Boosters, a.k.a. half the size of a regular pack. A.k.a. this is not be a draft ser- uh, set for drafting. Uh, and no Commander decks. And no Commander decks. Like, what the fuck are you doing, guys? I don't know. It's just... We, we, can believe we, have, we have complained vastly about this. Um, but let's move on to an actual set, which is the Bloomborough set. The pre-release for that will be July 26th. Uh, with the full release on August 2nd. And then Duskmorn, House of Horrors, which I just looked up the description of. Oh. Um, let me, let me, oh, I close it. Uh, anyway, it is a horror, obviously, the House of Horrors. It is set on a plane that is a one giant uh, uh, horror movie, basically. With, oh. With taking inspiration from things like slasher films. Oh, so kind of the aesthetic they were going for when they did the Innistrad Crimson Vow Midnight Hunt double feature set. Yes. Which was just the two sets combined into one with no new set symbol, and then they put all the art in grayscale with no curation whatsoever. That was a dumb decision. Yeah. But the the aesthetic they were going for was kind of like that old black and white slasher well, that, yeah, more. Well, that was Horror more monster film. movie. Whereas, yeah. whereas yeah. this one, it sounds like it's going to be a more like bit more Friday the Thirteenth, a okay. bit more okay. uh, Nightmare on Elm Street ordeal. Mm-hmm. Um, Bloomborough is going to be big. I'm telling Bloomborough you, right is now. going to be big. Uh, it's it's they they've done a very interesting thing, which is um, pushed away from kind of the more typical fantasy settings. Like obviously Dominaria is very is just the fantasy setting it is. Mm-hmm. Then you got Eldraine, which is of course the storybook fantasy. Mm-hmm. And then you got things like Ravnica, which kind of push into a little more um Magitech. Magitech, a little more Victorian era. But then of course we had Outlaws of Thunder Junction, which came out recently, uh going into an American uh Wild West sort of ordeal. And now Bloomborough is going to be based on uh 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 like your fairy tale creatures yeah uh watership down and things like that where everything is a everything including like planeswalkers are going to be uh little animal people little animal guys yeah you got i mean you got to protect the world in if i've learned anything from my experiences playing kingdom hearts Mm -hmm. the video the hit video game series kingdom hearts you got to protect the world order i was gonna say yeah got to protect it it's the star trek mentality yes you know you can't intervene too much even though (laughs) Even though now with the fucking omen paths, who knows? Right. And they've been, and it's not like they haven't been intervening in all of these various planes the entire existence of magic. I mean, that was what a planeswalker did. They, yeah, they shot into a plane and <laughs> fucked shit up. Yeah. yeah. Oof. Uh, anyway, don't talk, we're, we're in America. We can't talk about planes like that. Uh, <laughs> Duskmorn House of Horrors will be coming out in Q4 this year. We still don't have a release date for that. Yep. Uh, and of course, the Dagger uh, not not Wizards Coast, but the Daggerheart playtest from uh, Darrington Press. Is the playtest is out now? They've had a couple of rules updates now. One major one. Uh, They're going to be having a lot of play test events at Gen Con. So if you want to try and actually play Daggerheart and you don't have friends that are willing to do it, or you're just people aren't wanting to learn a new system, you can go to Gen Con. You can play with a lot of new people. We're going to try and get in on some of the, that action as well because Daggerheart seems like it's going to be a very large and disruptive force mm-hmm. in the tabletop gaming space. So. Once that's fully out, that'll be, I think, a big splash. Oh, yeah, it'll be fun. All things that'll told. Be fun. All right, well, let's get into the news. This week, 
we're going to lead off with the happy thing, which is one D&D, &D, <laughs> the one D&D &D fireside chat. Uh, this was a 20 minute video that they posted to YouTube with, um, oh my gosh, why can I never fucking remember these people's names? Uh, uh, uh. Chris Perkins and, and uh, oh, for fuck's sake, we're bad. At, we should. I'm I'm bad at name. I know Gavin Verhey, and that, that's <laughs> it. And he's magic. And he's magic. But yeah, uh, Chris Perkins and they were talking about Jeremy Crawford. Jeremy Crawford. Thank you. Good God. Jeremy Crawford and Chris Perkins. They were talking about the one D and D players' handbook specifically as they're starting to go into print. For that, they're, they're getting samples now, and they actually are starting to be able to hold the books themselves, which is a little bit crazy. Uh, but we learned a fair bit of information about the 1 D&D Player's Handbook, and we just have a quick run-through of some of the highlights there. Uh, for one, the way they've been writing and designing this book has been a little bit different than how they've done it in the past, where previously they would take... Um, they would write the book and then they would commission art kind of separately. Mm -hmm. The art creation and the text have been created simultaneously. So the writing has been influencing the art and then in turn the art in the book has been re-influencing some of the writing in terms of storytelling and lore and descriptions. Um, along those lines, along those lines, they're going to be, there's going to be a little bit of a new way that they do species art as well the species are what the race options were in the the previous player's handbook i'm kind of skipping through this list right now but species they're going to try and reflect more the personality of those of those species by creating the art instead of individuals mm -hmm. as collectives of the species so you can get uh, different touch points for visuals for that for those very species as well as putting them in a group setting where you can kind of get more of a vibe of their personality or how they would interact with one another in a group setting like that. So you can get a little bit more flavor from the creatures. Uh, and then of course, all the classes are going to have new art. There's gonna be new subclass art for some of them as well. It, 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 it's nice to see that there's been a bit more love and care put into the actual visual storytelling aspect of, of the books themselves. Then what's more important for, for actual playing of the game, there's going to be a larger page count. Uh, they really wanted to focus on getting rich content and value uh, with that page count and not just adding fluff to the page count. There's going to be more descriptions. There's going to be more rules. There's going to be a better layout for a rules glossary as well. And they really wanted to emphasize that despite the fact that these are revisions to 5th edition and a lot of the rules content is going to be relatively the same, they are going to be new books through and through. Uh, along with that, they're getting new guidance for rules and features. Guide one of the big things they highlighted was guidance on dealing with illusions. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard, very difficult to run as a DM. There's not really a lot of um, hard and fast, like how some of these spells, like minor illusion, like phantas well, phantasmal image, but <laughs> like uh, more things that are just kind of esoteric in the rules and are just kind of like figured out at the table. And then, of course, the deeper rules glossary, which is going to be uh, very helpful. That is one of the things I'm more excited about is just having a nice layout of all of the rules and being able to mm -hmm. more pinpoint and accurately find them in the book. Yeah, one big point they were talking about with this was, you know, these are supposed to be reference books and especially for new players and new DMs. Um, and the fact that, you know, before you would have to kind of search, you you'd go to the index and try to find, you you know, uh, you'd have to go to this text box and then you have to go down here to this page and then flip over. Uh, so yeah, one thing, you know, getting it laid out normally and laid out in a logical manner was one thing, but then also they're moving a lot of the rules mm -hmm. from the DMG to the player's handbook because if the players want to do something, All they should be able to just read how to do it. Exactly. Instead of having to be like, Hey, how do I do this? And a lot of the rules have been moved around to different locations where they make more sense to be as well. Uh, they didn't really get into the specifics of that, but once we have our hands on the book, I'm sure it'll be like, oh, it totally makes sense that the break an object action. Yeah, is, is, is. that was a big one was the was the break an object. How do you break an object? Well, that should be known to the player who yeah. wants to break the object, not exactly. necessarily in the DMG. In the DMG. Uh, but the fun bits, which are the classes and subclasses. They did officially announce that several of the subclasses that are going to be in the player's handbook, for one, there's going to be a fair few more of them. Yes. Asterisk the cleric. <laughs> Cleric's going to be reduced a little bit, I think. But 
Uh, they're going to be pulling some of the subclasses from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and they're going to be revamping them and revising them in the similar way that they've gone through and revised a lot of the players' handbook subclasses through Unearthed Arcanas mm -hmm. in the past, but they just haven't put them into Unearthed Arcanas. Uh, one thing that they highlighted a little bit was uh, the four four of the subclasses in the book are going to be psionic based subclasses. People really liked the mystic in theory and people have been wanting a lot of uh, a lot more psionics in D D, and so they've been creating new subclasses and new features that draw on that as that type of mysticism uh, and that kind of power so we're going to be of course getting the aberrant mind sorcerer and the great old one warlock but they are also moving in the soul knife rogue from tasha's cauldron of everything uh and the psi warrior for the fighter which is going to be replacing the brawler subclass uh, that seems to have been cut from the UA process. Uh, so we're getting some more psionic abilities, which I think will be very fun. They've also been multi-classing and going through and making sure that some of the things that were more broken in multi-classing across classes is a bit more reined in, while also making sure some of your core, very popular uh, multi-classing options mm -hmm. still remain cool and powerful. Yeah, this uh, was something interesting that the, they they added the mechanical uh, uh restrictions to limit the ones they thought were broken and obviously this is not the first time we've seen that mm -hmm. kind of thing in this in this play testing and into the one dnd process you know since the beginning they've been trying to redo rules as written into rules as intended absolutely um uh, but one of their catchphrases i guess for this was they want to uh protect the combo yes um so, so I, I would assume if you're going to look at, for example, a lot of the charisma based classes, mm -hmm. your paladin, your sorcerer, your war, the sorcerer warlock combination is notorious for being exceptionally powerful. Yeah. And I'm sure they don't want to completely remove that, uh, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of rein it in a little bit. Um, but that combination is still going to be very popular and powerful. Multiclassing like warlock and paladin. Yeah. All of that kind of stuff is still going to be very powerful just without breaking the rules as much or even like dipping into the fighter as the wizard a little bit to yeah get that action surge uh, to get a little bit more beefier more natural armor that kind of stuff yeah the big thing they've been always going they've been going for throughout this whole process is never making there be a a right um mm -hmm. a quote-unquote right choice they want you to have the option to play what you want and still be viable mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of a good place to leave this conversation is that they wanted to emphasize that they were opening the door to more character concepts. Yes. Than the original player's handbook. You can you can make any kind you can make more types of characters. They have new species options in the player's handbook that were not in other books. Uh, and they're bringing in some species options from other books and putting it into the player's handbook. And with the multi-classing rules and psionics and the new species and how all of these things can interact, you can really get way more character concepts out of just the player's handbook than needing something like the player's handbook plus Xanathar's plus mm -hmm. a campaign book or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a little a little postscript before we move on here. Uh, since the Fireside chat was released, Wizards of the Coast did confirm and reiterate there uh that they will be updating the system reference document for those of you that remember the ogl debacle a little over a year ago the whole problem there was they were wanting to take the open gaming license and restrict it uh so that you couldn't make third-party content using fifth edition without having some sort of contractual agreement to try and get more money out of third-party creators uh and since then a lot of that stuff a lot of the current fifth edition went into the pu the uh, public domain. Mm -hmm. So it's now just kind of open to everyone. But they wanted to reaffirm that the system reference document will be accurately and quickly updated with the 1D&D rule set so that they can preserve the ability of independent publishers to use the 2024 Player's Handbook rules for third-party content if they so desire. So that's just a nice little... Some people were kind of not believing that they would yeah. <laughs> after the OGL. But uh, even even just looking at the makeup of the company, I mean, we talked about on the last episode, uh, Cynthia Williams leaving yeah. as president of Wizards of the Coast and 
a lot of layoffs have happened at Wizards of the Coast, which is not a good thing, but the staff is definitely going to be newer. Uh, the leadership is going to be newer, and I would I, w- I would like to imagine that they have all of the necessary parts to kind of go the right path the first time. Yeah, with that, you know, a lot of that senior staff was, was a big part of the layoffs, mm-hmm. and you got to, again, the company that I work for went through a very similar thing about a year ago where a lot of the senior staff left, and now things are starting to change in not necessarily a more or a less conservative um, uh, business manner, but just a, you know, we got a lot on our plate, mm-hmm. and these things don't bother us the way they necessarily did the old people, the old the old regime, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Wizards, uh, the next Fireside Chat will be a deep dive into the player's handbook, so when that comes out, we'll have much more to talk about, yeah, I'm there, sure. There's going to be way more details in that, um, and I, I imagine that's going to be like a freaking two-hour video or something. Yeah, this is going to be a long one. So can't wait for that. That, That'll probably be an entire episode in and of itself, maybe even pulling in one of our our D&D friends Mm -hmm. for a bonus action to really dive into just that specific topic. We'll have to to see once once that fireside chat is posted. But that's the big happy thing. Yay! Now let's go into the business. The business. We're legitimate businessmen. Legitimate businessmen. Legitimate businessmen. And not the card legitimate businessmen. That is a card. Uh, isn't that? No, no. it's the one that makes a, yeah. that turns your creature into a legitimate businessman, which is just a 1-1 with no abilities. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Uh, we have the quarter one earnings report as well as the 2023 full year earnings report for uh, Hasbro. They did get ahead of this a little bit and let their investors know that not all is well, but they have a plan going forward. Yes. Which... Yes. Seeing this earnings report, I think it's very clear why Cynthia Williams stepped down when she did. Kind of what we predicted. Yes. Kind of what we predicted. Uh, So we're going to start with the full year 2023 highlights. As fans of D&D and Magic the Gathering and Wizards of the Coast products, I think it is very important that we understand the business aspect of it so we can understand where the company is and actually just have a better knowledge of what's going on in the industry as a whole because Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast are kind of the center pillar for trading card games and for tabletop RPGs. Yes. So how they're doing and what mistakes they're making and how their industry is working is kind of going to influence how the wider, broader industries are going to work. So for 2023, we have the full year of Hasbro Incorporated revenue declining 15% with growth in Wizards of the Coast and the digital gaming segment by over 10%, and more, which more than off, which was more than offset by declines in both consumer product segment, which is down 19%, and the entertainment segment, which is down 31%. A note that the entertainment segment is due in large part for them uh, removing the E1 film and television division of Hasbro. Mm -hmm. Uh, The company that helped make the Dungeons & Dragons movie, uh, they got rid of that all and wrote off a lot of that as losses, which is a large portion of why they have an operating loss of $1.5 billion, which $1.3 billion of it is due to non-cash, goodwill, and intangible asset impairment charges associated with the E1 film and television, uh, which will kind of change how their their books are just kind of oriented for a little while, but it's not going to be a long-term issue for the company. So they are still operating on a $200 million uh, operating loss yes. for the year, which is n- not very good. No. And it is interesting that that came in a year where you had some major tentpole releases from Wizards of the Coast. You had Commander Masters. You had Universes Beyond Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Um, those are two very, very big products. And Wizards of the Coast up 10%. Which, as we have talked about ad nauseum on this podcast, Wizards of the Coast is just propping up everything else. It is important to note, uh, we did look briefly at the actual earnings report, not just the finan- you have, we're at, we're at the financial breakdown. Yeah, this is uh, just, yeah we're, just, we're looking at bullets right now. Yes. Um, the Wizards of the Coast, while up, was less up than in uh, 2022. That is true. But we can, you know, all of these things... We, We've been saying for, you know, business doesn't, businesses always seem to want to make us think that it's always going to go up and up and up, but it can't forever. 
Um, I uh, to to pair, to continue off of that, yes. the tabletop revenue for Wizards of the Coast and the digital gaming segment specifically was in, was up only one percent on the back of Magic the Gathering with strong performances of the Universes Beyond Lord of the Rings set. And then operating pro- operating profit declined 2%, and then the operating profit margin of 36.1% uh, was also down, and they were attributing that largely to higher royalty costs associated with Universes Beyond projects. So obviously they're going to have to pay... Uh, gosh, what is it? The Embracer Group that owns uh, Lord of the Rings now, which I think is ridiculous uh so they had to pay them a lot of money to get the rights for middle earth and lord of the rings and they had to pay uh the bbc for doctor who and they Mm -hmm. had to pay for um um you to ubisoft for assassin's creed and they're gonna and all of these universes beyond uh are going to incur a lot more costs which is going to bring down their profit margin uh the operating profit being down two percent is a little bit concerning um particularly because their revenue was increased by 10 percent on, largely on the back of Baldur's Gate 3. Yes. Which was a huge release for the year. Um, but yeah, that's that's the core that's the core vibe of what's going on. Obviously, there's massive losses in the entertainment segment um, from the loss of E1. Uh, we have more we have there's more specific breakdowns from quarter four, but uh, we're gonna end here with the 2024 outlook that we have. So consumer product segment revenue was down seven to twelve percent, uh, with a four percent decline coming from businesses shifting to an out license model and a pro- operating margin uh, four to six percent. So they're trying to do more internal properties, things that they own for um, consumer products, which are more their toys, their toy lines, mm-hmm. uh, stuff that they own, like Transformers, Monopoly, that kind of G.I. stuff. Joe, as opposed yes. to doing, because they also have the contracts for uh, Disney properties such as Marvel and Star Wars when it comes to the toy licensing, and then, of course, all these mm-hmm. universes beyond. And those license and those licenses, um, there are also royalties associated with yes. that, which cut into the margin. So they're trying to leverage the things that they specifically own more in 2024, which is reasonable. Uh, Wizards of the Coast segment revenue down three to five percent, and decline largely driven by second half comp in licensed digital gaming with an operating margin of 38 to 40 percent this is notably way better than all the other segments of hasbro yeah uh and and the second half comp in licensed digital gaming seems to be a uh a delay like a multi level like a multi-tier multi-year deal of payments for these licensing agreements instead of just a lump sum all at once which is more than reasonable given the level of properties that they're working with yes and then finally, their priorities for capital allocation in 2024, which is how they're going to spend their money. This is important. And of course, being a corporation, mm-hmm. they're very vague. Well, yeah. <laughs> we get yeah. we get a ton, we get a ton of numbers for everything, for their data, for reports. And then they're like, "Here's what we're going to do going forward. Point 1, invest in core business." So that means hypothetically like we said already they're going to keep putting money into the tr- into the lines they own um probably they're they're investing great return cash to shareholders through a dividend uh, yeah yeah that's just yeah we're gonna pay a dividend great you're a corporation and then continue to pay down debt and progress towards leverage targets so they're trying to get rid of a lot of the debt that they have incurred from having to pay for these large licensing deals and other large purchases as a corporation um and the less debt they have the more their money can work for them instead of having to simply spend it on paying down their debt yes. and not incur as much interest on the debt uh, those are their three capital allocation priorities. So those are very fucking vague. Every company that has a pu- that is publicly traded in America has those goals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so nothing unique there. Um, the biggest things are revenue for Wizards of the Coast is down but still in the black. Yes. Which is what we want. Um, obviously... A lot of that is going to be remedied by the fact that they laid off a lot of people, so their revenue, their revenue and profit margin is probably going to go up. Um, that's also a, they've also been cutting down on their um, inventory. 
yes, in a lot are. of sectors as well. So they're not they're trying not to hold on to as much product and trying to get m- closer to a um, we make the product and then we sell almost all of it instead of shit sitting in warehouses forever. Um, which is partially why you see this move, particularly in Magic the Gathering, with the secret layers of moving from um, a a print run and just printing until everyone that wants one has one into a limited print run where they print a set number and once they're sold out, they're out. Um, So that kind of explains why they're doing it. Uh, Obviously people are not very happy with the, how limited the secret layers have been. Um, But yeah, that's just kind of, that's just kind of the vibe uh, that we've gotten off of this earnings report. I think it kind of reaffirms a lot of what we've been thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with, with everything that's happened you know, over the past two years of how the company's been run, and then all of the the domino effects we've seen from that, from the layoffs, from the uh, CEO leaving, um, we now, you know, this is not unexpected. Yeah, the, this is fairly within the lines. I will say, I think Wizards is doing not as well as we would have expected. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that if that is due in large part to leadership decisions that have been made. Yeah. Um, I still a lot of faith has been lost in Wizards of the Coast absolutely. over the past. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it is still crazy how a ten percent revenue share, a, a positive ten percent revenue for Wizards of the Coast was almost entirely making up the losses they've been making in the other sections of the company, which hmm. is crazy how much like a 10 percent for wizards of the coast like 10 percent for wizards of the coast is not the same as a 10 percent loss for consumer products or yeah. or what was it 30 percent loss for entertainment because yeah. those are percentages and not real numbers uh so wizards of the coast as a section of hasbro is like the main chunk and i think these numbers kind of indicate that and seeing a more detailed breakdown of specifically universes beyond for magic, the gathering in terms of the licensing agreement and kind of the delayed payments that they're having to make to license these things. I can kind of see why we were, we were very confused when they announced the layoffs. Obviously it's tragic and it's it's horrible for everyone that's losing their job, but we were particularly confused by the cuts that they were doing to the universes beyond team. Cause it's very clear that the universes beyond products are some of their hottest selling products right now between Lord of the Rings and Doctor Who and Fallout and Assassin's Creed probably isn't going to do very well, but um, the the even w- going further back into Warhammer and yeah. the more secret lair style universes beyond cards, like those were selling very, very well. Uh, and so we were kind of confused as to why they were making s- very clear cuts to the universes beyond section of Wizards of the Coast. But it kind of makes sense with how much money they're having to spend on simply licensing mm-hmm. these various products, which I think it also is making sense why we're getting things like Fallout and Doctor Who and no offense and no offense to these properties, like they're not mega mainstream. They're big. Yeah. They're big, but they're not Lord of the Rings big. They're not Marvel crossover big. You know, and they, it seems like they're trying to limit those specific universes beyonds so that they can kind of keep their their licensing costs down. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, the trend seems to, you know, each of these sets, each of these universes beyond sets bring in new people into the zone, into the into the space. And mm-hmm. they also just people who are fans of these things are just buying them to have them because, you know, they're cool and they're you know, and my god how many times have you know as these sets are leading up we see people you know we see articles about oh fans of this thing get ready for a new installment and it's the and it's the magic the gathering set um that being so, so like you know it's definitely a way to keep it in to keep that that hype train going but like you said it can't be it can't be a big bomb every time or else they're just going to big bomb yeah eventually so I think looking forward, looking forward, um, gosh, magic, magic is going to need to continue to do well. I think they're really going to need to hit on 
Bloomboro and Modern Horizons 3 mm-hmm. specifically. I think Assassin's Creed like I feel like the writing on the wall is that it's going to be kind of a dud. Well, yeah, then not only the fact that it's a smaller property. I mean, it's a big property, but it's smaller than Lord of the Rings and Marvel, like you were saying. But also the set, we already know the the creation of the set has been fucked since the failure last year of the um, Aftermath set. Yeah. But even, like, Doctor Who has broader appeal than Assassin's Creed. And I feel like Fallout, in terms of video games, has bigger, bigger and broader appeal than Assassin's Creed. Especially, uh, Assassin's Creed's made more games, mm-hmm. but I feel like the Fallout games are much more well-regarded than the majority of the Assassin's Creed line of, I of think properties. The, I think the problem, well, this is this is, a, this is a completely different topic if we want to skip my, opi- my opinions on Assassin's Creed, but... The early games obviously had a, a, I don't want to say just a charm, obviously a charm, that's why they got big, but like a formula Mm -hmm. that was very good. And eventually, I think it was right around... um, Black Flag? Well, Black Flag was kind of like, yeah, the the pinnacle, the peak of that era. And then it started to decline with that charm and that formula starting to fade away. And then they switched the formula at at Origins, Mm -hmm. at Assassin's Creed Origins, to make it more of this almost MMO feel this this you know kind of World of Warcraft style feel where it's like oh every time you do something you get new gear and then you're just supposed to continue to like level up your character with new little bits. It became more open world RPG. And it lost that original Assassin's Creed feel which they did just bring that back with the most recent edition or most recent release of Assassin's Creed Mirage mm-hmm. trying to get back to that original. But even when you're looking when you're looking at like the public view of various video game franchises like Fallout is much more well regarded than than um than Assassin's Creed in a lot of ways. Um and I feel I feel like people are way more excited about all the Fallout cards for Universes Beyond when they were starting to be shown than people have been excited for the Assassin's Creed cards. Like people seem to just be more concerned and weirded out by it. I mean, and that may just be the underpinning of how the cards are going to be delivered to us. Probably, and, well. and we've also only seen a dozen cards from it, mm-hmm. but there is also the threat that there's only going to be fifty cards, exactly. being an aftermath style set. Exactly. Um, so. We're all of that kind of remains to be seen, but the other big hit, like one D and D, is going to have to hit. Oh yeah, one D. Well, I think they're they're banking on that. They they really need specifically the player's handbook to hit. If the player's handbook hits, then the other books will come in line. Mm-hmm. But if the player's handbook is meh, or if the reception, God forbid, is negative, then a lot of work and a lot of money has been spent on products that like that could if if one D is a dud, if the player's handbook's a dud, that could be like the end of Wizards of the Coast owning Dungeons and Dragons. They might sell the IP off and that might be it. Yeah. For all we know. I mean obviously that's doomsday scenario, but that's not out of the realm of possibility with Wizards of the Coast for one, their margins are tightening. Mm-hmm. Their revenue is down, still in the black, but they're having to offset all these losses and all this other, on and oversight from Hasbro. Again, we it was it's been a very long time since we talked about uh, the the Alta Fox yeah. attempting to to force ha- uh, trying to get in on Hasbro and trying to get them to spin off Wizards of the Coast and make it its own entity. I think Wizards of the Coast would be healthier if it were by itself, but. That's neither here nor there. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? A lot of numbers. A lot of numbers. Uh, I would under you know it's it's very understandable that uh, a lot of people are going to be not interested in what that is exactly and just interested on the on the what does it mean? Yeah. Um, those numbers don't make a lot of sense when you just look at. at oh my god! When yeah. you're just throwing numbers out there, it's 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 very boring. <laughs> it's very boring <laughs> shit. But the numbers are important. And and the effect, the real world effect that they're going to have is important, and and being knowledgeable of that and being aware of that is important. Yeah. So. The numbers that we care about more: mana values and power and toughness. Let's talk about. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of spoilers for Modern Horizons three, and a lot of very blurry pictures. And then Wizards of the Coast was like, "Well, here's some of them. There's all these leaks going around. Here's some of them. That's fine." And 
my my tinfoil hat goes on sometimes because a lot of a lot of companies are known for their interesting marketing tactics and mm-hmm. it's well known that particularly for entertainment properties leaks are very valuable mm-hmm. in a lot of ways and obviously some of them are malicious link leaks like if you look at the video game industry with the last of us part two those leaks were detrimental um very detrimental and they didn't want any of that to get out but there are also there's also been a fair number of examples of companies leaking things on purpose and with the number of blurry pictures that you can still read the text on these cards like i'm not saying it's happening but i mean it's not too surprising i mean yeah. i wouldn't be surprised at all if that was the case but we have a small selection of cards that have been officially now spoiled by wizards of the coast and uh, we're gonna we're gonna look at them. So obviously we've seen Emrakul. Oh, just, just a minute, just like we're gonna look at them, and then just a minute of silence where we just. All right, we looked at them. Yeah. All right. <laughs> obviously we've been we've had the official reveal for a Johnny Nakato Pariah, the flip walker that flips to a Johnny Nakato Avenger. Uh, we've also had Emrakul, the world anew. Yes, another Emrakul, twelve mana, twelve twelve with a lot of fucked shit. But we're going to get into some of the newly shown ones, and some of them ridiculously overpriced in my estimation. For example, Nethergoyf. Nethergoyf is a, uh, a Tarmogoyf lookalike in black instead of green. So it's a single black mana for a star and one plus star Lurgoyf creature. Its power and toughness are equal to the number of card types among cards in your graveyard, and its toughness is equal to that number plus one. It also has an escape cost of one and a black, where you exile any number of other cards from your graveyard with four or more card types among them. Uh, Tarmogoyf, of course, kind of fucked modern for a long time. Yes. It, was a, it was like the boogeyman of modern. Nethergoyf is going to be powerful, but it's not going to have nearly the top end that Tarmogoyf had. I mean, it is obviously much cheaper, um, and it is actually in the correct colors for its effects. That is true. <laughs> um, that is true. This is also a little. We're gonna we're gonna say a lot of words here, but we do come at this from a commander perspective. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, a lot of the set is designed from a commander perspective as well. <laughs> even though it's yeah, it's it's the modern set, but we'll. I mean, we're gonna see uh, a lot of uh, homages to older cards and like Necrogoyf. Uh, and I believe one of the commander decks is Goyf based, mm-hmm. which sounds disgusting. Goyf based. Ugh. That's worse than moist. It's Goyfed. It's Goyfed. Oh, God. Uh, moving on from that. <laughs> Uh, Haragast erupting Null Kite. Uh, we're going to see a lot of Eldrazi versions of previous cards as mm-hmm. well. Which is very fun. It's a nine colorless mana, six, six Eldrazi dragon legendary with emerge six red, red. Uh, You can cast it by sacrificing a creature and paying the emerge cost reduced by that creature's mana value. Uh, So you can get the mana value on this very, very low for a six, six that when you cast the spell, you can exile your hand. And then if you do, you draw three cards. It has flying. And then each creature spell you cast has emerged. The emerge cost is equal to its mana cost, which is basically all your creatures now. You can sack a creature when you cast it and then get that mana value of the sacked creature as a reduction in the, the mana cost of the creature you're casting. Yeah. So that's going to be very fun. What, which ones? Which what other ones have been sticking out to you right so, now? Uh, go back up a little bit here we go the chthonian nightmare um so this is a uh, a new and this is a one in a black enchantment that says when it enters the battlefield uh you get three energy then you can pay x energy sorry let me let me speak that probably you can pay x energy sacrifice a creature and return chthonian nightmare to your hand or to its owner's hand uh, and then you can return target creature with mana value X from your graveyard to the battlefield. Activate only as a sorcery. Um, An interesting thing here. You're going to have to... Be, it's going to be returning the Chthonian Nightmare to your hand. Yes. So you are recasting it, which means you can... It's a way to now accrue energy counters as well. Yeah. And you can... I, I don't... I haven't looked. I was thinking about this last night as I was laying in bed. Uh, waiting to be taken into the dark depths of the Chthonian nightmares. Oh God! Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> but yeah, so you know, there's if you're a reanimating a one or two drop creature, uh, very easy to like you said accrue energy counters, 
And if you have, uh, if that creature somehow gives you mana when it enters, by tapping it, when you when it leaves, something like that, you can also just either pay for the cost of the of the Chthonian Nightmare itself, or even net mana, depending on what you have out. Uh, and so you can just, yeah, like you said, loop this, get a you know, accrue energy until you have enough to reanimate your, you know, your 11 drop, your 13 drop, whatever. Something big. Something big. That's fair. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, here's, here's a card that I would not be shocked if it was almost immediately banned in a lot of formats, which is Ugin's Labyrinth. It's a land that taps for two colorless mana. It taps for a single colorless mana natively, but if you exile a card with its imprint ability, when Ugin's Labyrinth and when Ugin's Labyrinth, oh my God, when Ugin's Labyrinth enters the battlefield, you may exile a colorless card with a mana value of seven or greater from your hand. If you do, its tap to add one colorless ability becomes tap to add two mana, and then you can also tap it to return the exiled card to your hand. So you're not permanently losing that card. So if you want it later. You can then tap the Ugin's Labyrinth to return it to your hand. Now, if there's one thing that I know about lands that tap for two colorless mana is that they can break a lot of eternal formats. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are saying, well, the imprint cost is so high because you have to have a card with a colorless card with a mana value of seven or higher. It's like, well, we're in an Eldrazi set. Yeah. For one. (laughs) And Eldrazi and Tron and all of those things are going Artifact to one land. creatures. It's There's plenty of ways that you can get Ugin's Labyrinth online, and then you don't even have to lose the card, because no. you're basically just saying, I'm going to save this for later when I have way more mana and I have a desire to cast it. Yeah, that's that's like one of the Im- one of the very, like, I don't I think any other imprint just like, all right, you can have it back. Kind all of, right. I mean, you've got the... Uh, Oh, which one's the one where you can tap it to cast it? Is that Ice Crown Scepter? Uh, I think that's Ice Crown that's, Scepter. But still, that's like that's a one or two. That's a one man. Uh, I think it's a one or two mana value. Instant sorcery. Yeah. It's, it's you're able to recast. You're copying it and recasting it yes. effectively. But this one is just holding onto a card for you in exactly. exile, and then giving you upside while you have it just kind of stashed away. Uh, I suspect that one's going to be ridiculous, and the pre-order price of eighty-five dollars is. Uh, Indicative of that. Uh, another one that I think is going to have a bit of a limited use, but also might not be... It might have a wider use than some people are saying, is a new zero-cost, sometimes, counterspell with Flare of Denial, which is one blue-blue for an instant counter-target spell. You may sacrifice a non-token blue creature rather than pay the spell's mana cost. Uh, if it were a blue creature, period, without the non-token, then this would probably be, It'd be way redonkulous. more. It would be way more valuable. But uh, it is limited to a non-token blue creature. So you have to have a creature on board. You have to have a creature on board that you are okay with sacrificing to counter whatever thing your opponent is about to do. Which, in a lot of instances, is like, fuck my board state. You need to not do what you're about to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is totally fine. Uh, but then it's also, in a worst case scenario, you're hard casting a three mana counter spell. Yeah, that's there's plenty of three mana counter spells out there, and it, it like you said, it's very like situation dependent, and I think that's what makes it feel better than than some, which is like if I ha- you know if I can if you're tapping out for something, I don't care about paying three mana mm-hmm. to counter whatever your win con is, but yeah, if I if this is this is looking bad, then well shoot, and- I might yeah I might sacrifice even my my value piece. Mm-hmm to get rid of to stop you so that i can have another chance well even if you look at some of the th- this is obviously going to be a very very prevalent in cdh mm-hmm. compared to some other formats but if you look at cdh some of the best the main counter spells that are being run you're gonna have like your your more inexpensive options which are your one mana like uh offer you can't refuse mm-hmm. swan song that kind of stuff which are limited in the types of cards you can be countering and then you're gonna have things like force of will which is a high mana value uh, counter spell, but you can exile a card from your hand to get it for free. The alternate cost is so very low. Yes, and even something like Pact of Negation, which is a zero mana counter spell, but you have to pay the man- three and blue blue at the upkeep. So Flare of Denial, while it's a little bit harder to get the free version of it as compared to something like Force of Will, the the upside of that is that it's just one mana extra to regularly counter a spell and if you if you watch cdh gameplay online 
Uh, there's plenty of situations where it's like, all right, I'm spending five mana and I'm hard casting Force of Will because mm-hmm. I need to. And being able to do that with three mana instead of having to hold up five can be a big benefit in those kinds of higher power games. Uh, so a lot of people are talking shit about the Flare of Denial, but I think it's going to be pretty all right. you have anything else you want to shout out in particular? Uh, I do like this White of the Reliquary. It's a black and a green for a zombie knight 2-2, uh, obviously in uh, reference to the Knight of the Reliquary. This thing has Vigilance, uh, and it gets plus one, plus one for each creature card in your graveyard. But more about it, I like is that it, you can tap and sacrifice another creature to search your library for a land card, a land card, not a basic land card, yeah, a land card. Land. And put it onto the battlefield, tapped, and then shuffle. Uh, black, green, Golgari. I love Golgari. Uh, love a sack outlet. And a sack outlet that ramps you? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, we're a big fan of that. Big Have, it, it, a two-mana sack outlet is fairly common. And it is a tap to sack, so it's not going to be something that you can repeatedly do, like a Viserysir. But uh, being able to just pull any land for a two-mana 2-2 two, two with Vigilance, that it becomes bigger and, in and of itself. And in a deck where you want a sack outlet, you could all, it's one of those where it's like, you can always use another one, another sack outlet. And there's plenty of tap sack outlets that are just that are just run because they're good, and I feel yeah. like that's going to be one of the top ones. Um, I want to shout out... Oh, gosh. There's so many cool, interesting cards. I want to shout out Philia, Exuberant Shepherd. We have another good old boy. A little corgi. A little legendary dog. It is a one in a white, 2-2 two, two legendary creature dog with flash and... When Philia Exuberant Shepherd attacks, exile up to one other target non-land permanent. At the beginning of the next end step, return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. If it's entered the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on Philia. While not instant speed, I mean it is instant speed with flash, but yes. the the the, tr- the triggered ability on it is not something you can activate instantly, as no. it doesn't have haste. Being able to flash in on an opponent's end step, this two mana, two, two, and then being able to attack with it, and then getting a blink effect, gonna be pretty cool. And as someone who has just finished building their Abdel Adrian Gorian's Ward slash Candlekeep Sage EDH deck, that'll be, that'll probably be an include over some of the other um, creature based blink effects that I have in the deck. So I'm into that right now. And I also, I think we both are a big fan of Kudo. King among, among bears. bears. It's a green and a white for a le- for a legendary bear. Two two, and it gives all other. It's a it's a universal effect. Other creatures have base power and toughness. Two two, and are bears in addition to their other types. And we like them for diff- we like this card for different reasons. Yes. <laughs> so you have your uh, Descana the Rage Mother. Yes. So all the creatures in that are already two twos. Uh, all of them. Mm-hmm. You don't have any non two two creatures in there. Descana. Wow. Even that... the tokens. But the cool thing about this is it makes my opponent's creatures 2-2s. Two so no matter what, when I go to attack and have Dusk on out, my things become 5-5s. Five mm, mm-hmm. That is true. That is true. They become very large. You also have a lot of Anthem effects and mm-hmm. counters, and uh, count, like plus one, plus one counters. Uh, and then all of your things are just going to base be a lot bigger. Exactly. I like I like Kudo more as a commander in an Anthems and... Uh, reverse anthems style deck we're getting it out to make everything an even playing field base uh, but then you get the advantage because you're the one that's running more anthem effects you're going to have top end cards like Elish Norn Grand Cenobite mm-hmm. all your things get plus two plus two and then all of your opponent's creatures get minus two minus two which means all of your opponent's creatures just die to state based actions if, if Grand Cenobite and Kudo are on board all of your opponent's creatures die to state-based actions unless they have an anthem effect or some kind of other boost to their power or their toughness specifically yeah uh and then you can run things that give minus one minus one to other creatures um it's not a huge amount of those in in those green, colors. white um but what i would love to build it as is i've been looking for a card that can helm a hydra deck mm, yeah. for me and so hydras are zero zeros that enter with counters and so having those be entering as two twos and then have counters on top of them basically all of your hydras are going to be able to get a plus one 
plus two plus two buff from base power and toughness going up thanks to kudo uh, and of course you can run a lot of protection uh there's a lot of protection enchantments and equipment and auras and that kind of stuff for the selesnia color combination and being sure. a two mana two two you're able to get your commander out early and protect it with something like a swift foot boots or and get like a, a, a totem armor enchantment on it and even if you and you're in green so even if he does get removed you know Oh no. Oh no, I've ramped up to nine mana. I guess I'll recast <laughs> him six times. Oh yeah. Uh, I'll be, just a quick run through. Winter Orb, two mana artifact. Players can't untap more than one non basic land during their untap steps. Non basics are running a little bit rampant. Winter Moon. Winter, winter Moon, sorry. Sorry. I'm, there's all these various orbs <laughs> yes. that are stacks pieces. Uh, Null Elemental Blast, which is a colorless instant to counter target multicolor spell or destroy target multicolor permanent. I think it's going to be used more as a destroy target multicolor permanent effect than a counter multicolor spell. Yeah. Uh, multicolor spells are a little bit less common unless you're countering like a commander. Urza's Cave. Uh, it's going to let you search for any land at the cost of three mana and sacrificing and putting it out of the battlefield tapped and then shuffle. It's going to be useful in a lot of decks that want specific lands. Snowcover Wastes. Yeah. Is now a thing, which is neat. More snow covered lands, more way to get wastes into the pool of cards out there. Yeah, get it into the yard. And then we'll move on to some of the commander deck cards. Yes, the modern set has commander decks. You get Final Act, which is a blue, or which is four black, black for a sorcery, which is a board wipe. All, it, it gives white color vibes. <laughs> Yeah, it has a very interesting selection here, which is destroy. You choose one or more, destroy all creatures, or and or destroy all planeswalkers, and or destroy all battles. We do know there are more battles coming out. Mark Rosewater has confirmed that on Blogatog. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just have to, you know, design two years in advance. Yeah. Uh, exile all graveyards, very common. But this is the one that's most interesting, I think, to me is each opponent loses all counters. Are those counters associated with the player, or all of their th- things lose the counters? I assume uh, it's the ones associated with the players. The that's... players. So that's going to be... Right now, The only, I can only think of two. Which Oh, three. Sorry, three. There's experience, mm-hmm. there is energy, and there is poison counters. Yeah, those are the main three. Um, that seems very niche. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> but... It also wouldn't really be applicable in an environment where you are trying to win with poison counters because it only removes opponent's poison counters. So if poison counters are involved at all, not really a use there. It seems like a counter to energy decks, but also energy is not super powerful enough right now. It seems like that option is there because this is in the commander decks for Modern Horizons 3. That it seems so stupid to say out loud. <laughs> <laughs> but that seems like this is like this deck's counter to the Jeskai energy deck. Is it Jeskai? No, it's Is it? Is it, is it or Jeskai? I don't remember. I can look real quick. To the energy uh, precon that you're getting from modern horizons three uh there's also three other cards which are march of march from velis vel two in a blue sorcery for that will let you choose a non-basic land type for each land you control of that type becomes a copy of target creature you control until end of turn and it gains haste and then you can flash it back for four in a blue so turning a bunch of your lands into creatures it is jeskai it is jeskai i was right I was right. Uh, the other very, very big one, which I think is going to be ridiculously expensive, and whatever deck has this one is going to be ridiculously expensive, is a land, Planar Nexus. Planar Nexus is every non-basic land type, and they list it out. Cave, desert, gate, lair, locust, mine, power plant, sphere, tower, and urzas. Taps for colorless, and then you can pay one and tap it to get a mana of any color enters untapped and is every non-basic land type so it's going to fit very nicely into all of those strategies (laughs) i'm also sure it's the one that goes with march of velis Vale because uh the non-basic and non-basic and also it is the only there's only one nope nope sorry there are two decks there are two decks decks with blue it's either the eldrazi or the energy i feel like it's going to be the eldrazi one this feels like this feels like it's eldrazi this, this totally feels so drowsy. Oh, well, well there, I guess there is Tricky Terrain. Ooh, that one's land-based, isn't that it? That one is land-based. Yeah, that's probably that's, the one, then. That feels, yeah, that yeah. feels good. That will that one will be... That one, I feel like, is going to be low-key at release, and then it's going to slowly become the most uh, expensive one. And then, lastly, we have a Lieutenant card. The Siege Gang Lieutenant. This seems to be more 
something you were excited about. The oh, lieutenant I like though. I like a lieutenant. You know, a little uh, one of those cards that you just get a little value for having your commander on board. Mm-hmm. Yep. Three and a red for a two-two goblin with lieutenant. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control your commander, create two one-one red goblin creature tokens. Those tokens gain haste until end of turn, and then you can pay two to sack a goblin, and then siege gang lieutenant will deal one damage to any target. Which that'll, is that's an auto include in any goblin commander deck. <laughs> which is uh, uh, interestingly similar to one of the non commander cards, the Eldrazi. There's an Eldrazi goblin, which is where is it? Where as, is it? There's an Eldrazi drone. There it is. Spawn oh, yeah. gang commander, which is three red red, for a two two that creates three Eldrazi spawn, and then you can pay one in a colorless uh, to sacrifice an Eldrazi to do two damage to any target. It's interesting. That is fucky. I like it. That's so interesting that they're designing these kind of Eldrazi versions of other cards. Yeah, with that one and, set. and Null Drifter. Yeah, the Null Drifter being a Mole Drifter style thing. It's a seven mana four four Eldrazi elemental. When you cast it, you draw two cards. It has flying in an Isle or one. You can also evoke it for two and a blue, which is you just cast it and then it's immediately sacrificed when it enters the battlefield. So you get the draw two. It's a divination effectively. But yeah, those are the Modern Horizons 3 uh, spoilers. Uh, they are not all of the spoilers. leaks. There's even more leaks that have come out. Um, so yeah, that those are the core stories that we have for the day. Do you have anything else you want to say about Modern Horizons 3? Uh, I mean, it looks like it's going to be cool. Looks like it's going to be fun. Very excited. Um, I mean, hopefully the modern players are happy. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know the commander players are going to be eating it up because it's going to have all the fetch lands too. <laughs> So that's a whole other, that's a whole other, and there's a whole lot of reprints that are of value as well. So we're going to move now to the wrap up. We've got five little ditties we want to talk about. First, a comment from Wizards of the Coast. They released a an FAQ where they were addressing the recent, quote, mistakes around Dungeons and Dragons AI art. Uh, they released this on Twitter, the FAQ, very wordy, very corporate speak, but... Wizards of the Coast requires art. They said, quote, Wizards of the Coast requires artists, writers, and other creative professionals who contribute to either or both games to, quote, refrain from using generative AI tools when crafting products. To combat those that may be using generative AI, Wizards of the Coast disclosed that it was using, quote, regularly evaluating resources that could be used to detect when someone uses generative AI. Company also elaborated on why it may not respond to all fans' claims that generative AI have been used in their art in artwork. One reason is that the internal investigation found the results inconclusive, or that it made an internal decision not to work with an artist who used generative AI going forward, but not publicly commenting on it to quote protect the privacy of one or more individuals. This is obviously in response to all of the AI controversy between Magic the Gathering art. People have also been lambasting um, Dungeons and Dragons art, and they've even lashed back a little bit saying like no this one definitively was not using generative ai yeah uh um, there was uh, uh, uh was there the was dwarf. the dwarf yeah so uh back in bigby's presents uh they did have something that yes slipped through yeah there were was, some giants um but then yeah when they uh first announced first showed off the artwork for the dwarf for the new player's handbook a lot of people were going out, were going at it. Oh, this is generative AI. It's generative AI. And I think it just proves more to me that people don't know how to recognize what is generative AI, mm-hmm. which I think is partially the problem for this. But they have their comments. Uh, obviously, they have their own internal policies. And obviously, they're not going to call out every single artist because there's legal ramifications for that. Yeah. Like, uh, the, the artists that did Trouble in Pairs, like, that's very clear plagiarism. And... <laughs> They're no longer working with Facebook. They're no longer working with them, and they had a comment about them. Yep. But when it comes to generative AI, it's like there's a lot of gray area, and they don't want to be putting themselves on the hook for a defamation lawsuit. Yeah. So obviously they don't want to use generative AI. Next, there's a new most expensive Magic the Gathering card. A record-breaking sale of $3 million in a private sale for a CGC graded pristine 10 black lotus. Uh, this was sold this year. Uh, it is the highest 
graded card from the CGC Corporation. There are three main card grading organizations, which are PSA, Beckett, and now CGC is one of the newer ones. This Black Lotus was given a grade of 10. It's from the original Alpha set, sold for $3 million, which eclipses the $2 million sale uh, to Post Malone for the one of one one ring card that happened last year, which was only $2 million. Are you trying to invest in a three million dollar black lotus? I got a guy. I know a guy. You got a guy? Yeah. Mm. He's got a he's got a pristine ten. You know what's what's uh crazy to me is uh, our our friend, our dear friend Lincoln, um was telling me about one uh I like a year ago he went to a con mm. and he was walking around with a buddy of his who's a doctor, and they go to a booth that has graded cards and there's a black lotus for sale. Um, and, and the dude just calls up his wife and is like, hey, I'm going to buy this. Oh, yeah. No, that's a good investment. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Here's however tens of thousands of dollars. And it's just like. Fucking Christ, dude. And it's like, ugh, wow. Like, was it ungr- Was it a graded? I believe, yeah. Yeah, that's I think, fair. And, and Lincoln's like, I mean, going to call Megan. No, can't afford that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing is with these cards, like, they're alpha cards, they're reserved list. They're, if they're already graded, like, they're only going to go up in value because they're only going to become more rare. Yeah, they're, what's that, what's it called? Uh, blue chip? Is it blue chip? The, like, the, it's investments you make that rich people make that aren't just yeah. stocks. They're in, they're art. They, they're, yeah, they invest in art. They invest in, as, like, assets that retain value for, non-financial reasons yeah and it's inter and it's like of of all the things in the gaming space this is one of the yeah, this is like definitely i mean i think as far as i understand it qualifies as that so i would not i would absolutely agree i mean 19 what is that 1983 1993 1993 Ooh, yeah, 1993 Magic the Gathering limited edition Alpha Black Lotus as a pristine ten. I mean, that's about that's about the pinnacle of what you can get in Magic the Gathering. So, that was just an interesting little thing. We also have an announcement from Wizards of the Coast Secret Lair: a Hatsune Miku, Hatsune Miku for all the weebs out there. She's very popular, like I'm, stupidly popular. I'm not actually familiar with this property. She, this character has been around for so fucking long, and as someone who's vaguely weebish i have my weeby tendencies from time to time persona for example Mm -hmm. but like even as far back as like playstation portable games there was hatsune miku fucking music games and there's hatsune miku shit for other playstation and steam and uh uh, the fucking playstation vita Mm -hmm. had hatsune miku stuff hatsune miku is ridiculously huge and we are getting a secret lair uh a series of secret layers. This is the first of four. Yeah. And this one include is called the Sakura Superstar, where you're going to get an array of six cards with Hatsune Miku art. We're getting Miku the Renowned, which is a, uh, a Universes Beyond version of Feather the Redeemed, as well as Miku Lost But Singing for Azusa Lost But Seeking, which is hilarious. That's a great one. We're getting the Inspiring Vantage Boros Land. Uh, it enters untapped if you control two or fewer. You get a Harmonized Repent, which is a green two green green sorcery to draw three cards you get miku's spark which is a universes beyond version of chandra's ignition target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each other creature and each opponent and then shelter which is one in a white instant target creature you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn and then you draw a card hatsune miku very big this is going to sell out very very quickly and i imagine these cards are going to be worth the this specific art on yes. these cards is going to be worth more than the regular cost of secret layers, which is thirty for non foil and forty for the foil versions. Uh, it is a bit frustrating though that this is these are an array of cards where four of them go together, and then there's two green cards. But I'm, alas, here we are. I mean, like you said, this is going to be one of four, so we have still uh, several secret layer drops, and I'm sure eventually one of them will be that commander. That Naya commander, or who knows, maybe something else that we that uh, that you probably would like to throw all of them into a deck with. I imagine. I imagine. Uh, I just think that Miku lost but singing is hilarious. That is hilarious. That's a very very funny thing. So we'll keep it weeby now. 
The cult classic Magic the Gathering manga is also officially being released in English for the first time. This was released as a short run several years ago in Japan and is now getting and went later on to a longer run uh, and now is going to get an English release. It is Destroy All Humans, They Cannot Be Regenerated, a Magic the Gathering manga. It was released this fall in 2024. It was announced by Viz Media uh, that it will be released. Uh, the original story by Ka... Katsura Issei, and art by Takuma Yakoda, who will release in fall, and is going to include an exclusive card. We do not know what that card is yet. Uh, it could be a reprint of a card from the manga. It could be a unique card to the manga. It could be featuring art. from. It could be a whole myriad of things, uh, but something to look into, because that might be a worthwhile investment if it's just the price of a normal manga book, and then you get the Magic the Gathering card, and if that card happens to be a very good card, a valuable card, might be worth your while plus i mean if you're into manga and you're into magic the gathering there you go I, the whole the whole thing is that there's this this high school guy that plays magic and he's kind of a nerd and people tease him about it but then there's this girl that shows up and she's also into magic and it's a whole fucking thing it takes place in the 90s yeah so like you. early magic it's very really cool. interesting i i wish i wish we just had more stories like this you know this is a fun this is cool this is this is gonna you know it's gonna make a lot of people in this community happy yeah oh oh i mean just, just looking at that anime girl, she's going to be a waifu. I can tell you that that much God. right now. She's a high and schooler. She's I know. a high schooler. I know. Get your mind out of the gutter. Get, clean the gutter. Get up on the ladder. Get up on the ladder. Clean out the gutter. Fall off the ladder. There you go. <laughs> fall off the ladder to the ground. My question is, uh, which which character in this manga has a Boston accent? Mm, I don't This isn't Yu-Gi-Oh. It's not nearly <laughs> angular enough. <laughs> It's not nearly <laughs> angular enough. If you're into this sort of thing, have at it. I'm sure we're going to get a secret lair at some point. And then finally, Magic the Gathering Pride event, bringing a major rule shift to Commander. Pride Month month is just four weeks now, three weeks away, and Wizards of the Coast is getting ready to celebrate in style a brand new Magic the Gathering Pride event titled Magic Presents Pride is scheduled for the end of June. This is a commander event that is going to bend the rules of the format, taking the popular partner mechanic to new heights, both in terms of gameplay and flavor. While casual in nature with prizes that may not be exciting for competitive players, this is still a very thematic event and also represents a further step for Magic's progressive attitudes. Following the Pride Across the Multiverse secret lair from two years ago, uh, the main the main rules change is that all of your commanders are going to have partner. All legendary creatures gain if they do not have partner gain partner. Yes, so you can pair up any two legendary creatures in all of Magic's history. I don't think we need to go into the reasons about why that might be very busted <laughs> to do in terms of gameplay. It is very casual. <laughs> they, they again, they like they stated the prizes are not, are it's 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 meant to be casual. The prizes are are going to be non non competitive prizes. Yeah. Um, and I think the idea and the the hope that all people who decide to participate in this will do something fun. We'll do something, you know, maybe that the, that they don't normally get. You know, play a color, play two commanders that give you a new color or that give you a color combination that lets you play some of your favorite cards together. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, not just like solving the equation in the command zone yeah there's there there will be people that will do that oh absolutely um, like you can't stop that i've been doing this for years at this point with my mardu vampires deck of edgar the charmed groom and olivia the crimson bride two characters from innistrad's crimson vow that uh would have been very thematic for them to have partner with i think uh, so I combined them, and the two of them are much, much cheaper than the quintessential eminence commander of Edgar Markov. And I think the entire deck that I have right now is worth less than the singular card of Edgar Markov. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. If you're into that, it will be from June 28th to 30th. Uh, unfortunately, the event will be exclusive to WPN stores in the United States and Canada. Um, but yeah, and there are some exceptions. Uh, the event itself is a standard commander night. Yeah. So I don't think all of them are going to be participating, but it will be exclusive to WPN stores for that weekend, June 28th to 30th. If you feel so inclined, that is all we have in terms of the news for this week. Uh, the major stories, we had several major stories and a lot of good wrap up, but we will end the podcast as we always do with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the TikTok live comment section. We record the podcast live on Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, live on TikTok. The podcast will then go live the following day on Patreon. You can also submit questions on the newly formed 
Patreon podcast thread, which will be going up several days before we record the podcast. If you feel so inclined, that would be the best way to get your question, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas read on the show. Samuel, mm-hmm. you're looking you're looking at me and not the phone, which makes me feel like we don't really have anything. The live died a couple about an hour ago. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I probably got a phone call or something. Maybe, yeah. That checks out. That checks out. Alas, no questions for this episode. Of course. Of course. Ah, of course. It's fine. Spectacular. Spectacular. This has been a bit longer than our normal episodes, which is totally fine. You know so. what? It's it's these days that we actually have news. something to talk about. It's nice. That is nice. Yeah. Like a lot of the times, so we, you know, we're, we're just reviewing a set. We're reviewing a book. We're talking about a controversy. Uh, to have some actual beef. Yeah, some some meaningful content is nice, yes. for sure. Uh, with that being said, we will see you in two weeks' time. Or maybe a little bit more than two weeks' time if you're a freeloader, which is totally fine. Feel free. Let's go with something besides freeloaders. It seems has a negative connotation. Yeah, well, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with a, a friend of the scally- channel. Nothing wrong with a scallywag. A rogue? Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if we need... Uh, or we need, somebody with rackish charm? I don't know. I don't know. Someone who passed their charisma check. That we'll go with that. We'll go with that. We will see you next time on the Duels of Mandor's podcast. In the meantime, peace. <laughs>